Welcome to Ipswich City Council's online Enviro Forum. Today we've got Martine. She'll be presenting the third presentation of this series of Changing Landscapes. Martine's presentation will go for approximately 45 minutes and at the end there'll be time to ask questions. You can type your questions in the box and Martine will be able to respond. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on from where we have all gathered today and recognise their continued connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I would like to kind of kick off with Martine now and thank you so much Martine for being here today to present to everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for joining this um, presentation. I'm really excited to talk about some of the cool woodland birds that uh, we have living in this part of the world. I'm a professor of environmental management at the University of Queensland. And uh, my research group works on bird ecology and conservation and conservation policy. So uh, really at the intersection of, of science and policy. And um, I'm uh, going to, I must acknowledge before I start that the work I'm going to talk about is done by my research group, but also by many other collaborators from uh, across Australia over probably about 15 years. So it's um, a really huge uh, collaborative effort. And it's such a huge topic to be talking about as well. Um, the, the, the way that the changing landscapes of our country are affecting its wildlife and particularly its birds. So I can really only touch on a few aspects of that, of that huge issue right now. Um, but I'm really interested to see your questions. So do feel free to put questions in the chat box and I'll try to remember to check it as we go and maybe it can be um, somewhat um, interactive. What I do want to say um, at the start of the talk though is that I want to dedicate the talk to Dr. Doug Dow. Doug uh, was also a passionate ornithologist and a lecturer at the University of Queensland as well as along with many many other things including president of the RAOU now BirdLife Australia and he was also the first person to really study and document the amazing social behaviour of one of the stars of today's talk, Noisy Miners. And he did that work in the 70s, um, really near where we are now in the, in the Lockyer Valley. Um, Doug sadly passed away earlier this month, but his contributions to ornithology, I think, will always be remembered and they're absolutely core cool reading for um, most students who come through my lab if they're, if they're going to be studying birds. And one of the other birds that Doug actually worked on in his career was um, the babbler. And I don't know how many people online are mad birdo types, but if you're from Queensland, you probably might be a bit surprised to learn that when I first moved up here in 2004 from Victoria, I was incredibly excited to be able to find grey crown babblers jumping around in peri-urban areas around Toowoomba where I was first based and um, more recently I'm now in um, the Brisbane Valley just near Marburg. And I just thought this was incredible. And the reason I thought it was incredible to be able to see these birds is because this species is really quite sensitive to landscape change, but it often has a delayed response to that change. And one of the reasons it's sensitive is because this bird, the grey crown babbler, lives in groups, family groups, and they need to be in groups to sort of raise young. So it's not enough um, for uh, just a couple of birds to be hanging on. You need sort of big groups living together and they need enough habitat and they need safe habitat. And of course, much of their range has lost their habitat. So um, I'm hoping that you can see this little um, inset. It's not a super clear map, but I think it gives you an idea of the sort of change we're talking about. The pink areas are the, are the drier woodlands, you know, places where grey crown babblers once would have occurred that have been cleared, completely lost. And the green is what remains. So you can see that in southern Australia, especially the wheat and sheep belt of southeastern Australia and southwestern Australia, are both uh, so depleted of this habitat. And as a result, this species is extinct in South Australia. And 
it's extinct throughout Western Victoria as well. There's still a few birds in Northern Victoria and the only reason they're really hanging on there is because of a huge amount of really dedicated um, conservation work, restoring the little patches of habitat on roadsides um, and so on to protect these birds. But you know, they are, they are very uh, threatened, that population. And they're also listed as threatened in New South Wales. So you can see that as we're creeping up north, um, we're sort of watching this wave of, um, of threat, of loss of, of grey crown babblers, of local populations disappearing, blinking out, in some cases, permanently. Now they're still here in southeast Queensland, as I said, which is brilliant. They are such entertaining birds. If you've never watched these guys, if you come across them, stop, watch their antics. They hang out in groups, they jump around on the ground, they throw leaves about, and they do this fantastic call, which if I was better with technology, I would have a link and play the call for people. Um, but for how long will this be the case? These declines are creeping northwards, and we are continuing to modify Queensland, southern Queensland, and especially southeast Queensland, um, you know, at a great pace. The areas that these guys like to hang out are those messy areas where there's still scrappy, maybe bits of regrowth even, still some um, timber lying around on the ground. And those places are being cleaned up, they're being replaced with dense suburbs and places that they don't live. So I predict that this is one of the species that although it's not currently threatened nationally or in Queensland, it's one of the next ones to join that list. And this is a really big issue because when we think about threatened birds, birds that are threatened with extinction, we tend to think about the real poster children for this problem. So things like the region honey eater, down to only a few hundred birds or the swift parrot um, or the black-throated finch, which has lost more than 80% of its habitat and it's down to just the last uh, few populations of the southern subspecies, which used to occur right, right throughout this area. So we, we, we tend to hear about these threatened species in the news. They're nationally threatened. They are um, sadly often heard about in the context of developments that continue to threaten their habitat. But we are going, we are looking at the loss of a lot more than just this sort of relatively smaller list of already threatened species. There's also all these other declining species living in the same woodlands and also suffering from um, the changes to our landscape and the threats um, that we are just adding to um, the pressures that we're adding to, to the habitat that remains. And so a lot of these birds are like the small, little, maybe nondescript, maybe you think of them as quite common birds that we sort of take for granted until they disappear. So things like the fairy wrens, the robins, the little fawnbills, the tree creepers, whistlers, small honey eaters, uh, speckled warblers. So you'll notice maybe that all of these birds tend to be small body birds um, and they, they're not famous. Um, although if you, um, uh, are in southeast Queensland at the moment, you're probably hearing and enjoying the Rufus Whistler, which is calling right outside my window right now. But all of these species actually belong to groups that are starting to be listed as uh, in danger in other states to the south, where the clearing has happened um, much longer ago and the impacts of that land clearing have really um, sort of fully been felt. And this is important because Ecosystems rely on having the full complement of animals and plants, all of which are doing important ecological jobs in that ecosystem. Um, so they're doing things like, um, you know, insect pest control or, you know, seed uh, dispersal or turning over the leaves, turning over the leaf litter. They're doing the pollination work. Uh, they're doing, they're, they're moving seeds about, they're doing the um, control of, uh, so the scavengers and so on are doing, um, uh, are consuming dead material, cycling it back into soil eventually. You know, all of these different roles that the diversity of species all occurring together in one place, that's a really important thing. That's what makes ecosystems function and makes them persist in the long run. And without that, um, ecosystems will collapse.
And so just focusing on a few species that are already threatened and in many cases are already so rare that they're not actually fulfilling many of these roles in, in these um, uh, remnant habitats, um, it, it misses the, the really important focus on how landscapes function. And so, as I say, many of these little things are disappearing too. They're just not yet listed as threatened here in Queensland, even though they are elsewhere. So why is that? Why is it that they're declining? And so obviously the map that I showed earlier gives a pretty clear clue. So this is a more detailed map, and this shows where um, woodland and forest habitat. So the other one had just the drier woodlands, but this is sort of woodland and forest habitat throughout Australia. Um, before we started uh, knocking it down. This is how much remains now. So it's a, it's a really, really stark demonstration of how much habitat is simply no longer there for birds to occupy. So the vast majority um, of many birds populations are gone just because there is nowhere for them to live anymore. And when you think about the pattern of that loss, this is some work that really shows starkly how important where we've done that clearing is. So this is work led by Jeremy Simmons, who's a postdoctoral fellow working with me at UQ. And you, you can zero in on the part of the world that we're in there and, and see that it's red. Now that's because those are areas where the loss of a hectare of habitat has an impact on the largest number of species. So over 150 species, have lost habitat when you bowl over a hectare in this part of the world. This is a really species rich place for you know, woodland and forest birds. So um, the, 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 the colours on this map, they're just showing the bits of habitat that have been cleared. So all of those colours are parts of the woodland and forest landscapes that once existed that no longer do. And the colour, how red the colour is, tells you how many species went along with that habitat. So it's really important that we think about um, uh, that we think about not just the loss of like the last couple of individuals of a species, but that we think about how we change landscapes such that really previously common species are now only occurring in a few little places, and they're no longer doing the important ecological roles that they once did. And the problem is, of course, that this is not just a historical um, thing. It's not that we did the clearing and then we stopped. And Queensland, of course, is um, a pretty clear example of a place where land clearing rates are still very, very high hundreds of thousands of hectares a year, over 100,000 hectares of old growth habitat as in original ecosystems, not regrowth, being lost every year. And here in southeast Queensland, I see it all the time, you know, when I drive into Fernvale, every couple of months there's another patch of bush that's gone and replaced with um, houses. Um, or in fact, I was down at South Ripley, you know, you drive through a lot of areas that are, are being lost. So there is no surprise that we are losing huge uh, numbers of birds across the landscape and that that's putting pressure on the continued existence of entire species, yes, but it's not just that. It's the fact that we are losing ecological function right across our landscapes because of the loss of common species too. So what we end up with is a really denuded landscape with just very small little patches. And um, we end up um, with um, these little patches being all that's left. And I think that a lot of us are really conditioned to think about small patches as being not that important because they're small. And we know that big areas of habitat are important. They absolutely are, we need them. But if we don't have them, then small patches are all there is. And small patches in those landscapes that are extensively cleared, like much of southeast Queensland, they are critically important to having our birds hanging on across huge areas. And we can easily think, okay, well, but there's still, you know, there's still lots of bush up in the mountains. But we've also got to remember that 
birds have habitat preferences. So every different species, like any species of animal, has a particular type of habitat that it likes to live in. Birds are, this, this, a given species doesn't just occur everywhere. And grey crown bubblers are a really good example of a species that likes the flat land, the good quality land for agriculture, that, the, the really productive land. And so because of that, you can imagine um, that they're in pretty strong competition for that land. We would like that land, we want to grow our food on it. And as you can see in this picture, we do a very good job of appropriating that land and making it unsuitable for all of those species that needed it. So it's not just about how much habitat there is in a region, it's about where that habitat is and whether we even have um, remnants of certain ecosystem types. This is a bala remnant. Um, out on the Darling Downs. And so these are obviously very few and far between. But when you find them, they're really, really rich with birds. Um, I worked on tiny patches and birds in tiny patches for my PhD, which um, <laughs> was nearly 20 years ago now, which, which is a terrifying thing to say. But I worked in the Wimmera Plains of Western Victoria, and this photograph could equally have been taken in the Wimmera Plains, and it could have been a, a bull oak woodland patch. But the really weird thing about that study I did, we were, I was working in patches that were only a few hectares in size, and yet they actually had a really good complement of small woodland birds, including many of those species that are threatened. Um, and uh, I'll be able to tell you why towards the end of this talk, don't let me um, tell you, but that was always that was always quite a surprise because this, the received wisdom was, oh well, small patches, you won't get things like robins and tree creepers and so on. Well, it turns out that if you look after your small patch well enough and it's the right type of small patch, you actually can. But that's by way of background to say that when I moved to Queensland, I was really excited because I was expecting I was going to be able to find, um, you know, really fantastic habitat for birds because I was going out into landscapes that looked like this, if this is going <laughs> to come up. There we go. So, you know, this is a photograph taken at Carnarvon Station Reserve. And just look at the extent of beautiful uh, woodland and, you know, apparently intact woodland. If I was finding pretty good birds in small patches in southern Australia, I'm going to find fantastic birds in these large patches. The first large patch I actually went and worked at was Barracoola State Forest um, out near Chinchilla. And it turned out that uh, it was a, a bit of a disappointment because even in these great big patches, the, the woodland birds weren't really there. Um, and I was quite, I was quite shocked by this. Um, you know, as I say, the, the idea is, you know, big areas of habitat, that's what we need. But it turns out that is not the only thing we need. Because in these big areas of habitat in Queensland, all sorts of other things are going on. So um, some of the, oops, some of the things that are going on here are roads, Barracoola forest, and many of those state forests, sorry, I'm having a we're having a bit of a lag in the in the <laughs> transition of slides. So Barracoola State Forest and many of the other state forests out there are really crisscrossed with roads. And so there's a lot of edges and edges are different ecologically to the interiors of forests. And that can change the sorts of species that can occur. But they're also, many of them are grazed either um, with grazing leases in place or with feral cattle um, and feral horses for that matter. And so you can see in this picture on the top right, the sort of degradation of the understory, it opens out the woodland and, and makes it um, quite uh, not as complex in its habitat structure. Also, many of these forests, but particularly Barracoola forest, was burnt really regularly because Barracoola, if you know it, it's, it's sort of got a, a, a patch of cypress pine forest, which was still intended to be cut over for timber extraction surrounded by like a donut of more spotted gum, um, you know, uh, eucalypt ally type forest. And so to protect the colotris um, from big fires, fire was put through that spotted gum and ironbark and other eucalypt type forests uh, very regularly. And that of course has the same sort of effect. It pulls out the understory, it opens it up and makes it less complex as a habitat, um, uh, as a habitat structure. And so, you know, the, the reason all this is a problem 
partly because it directly changes habitat structure for small birds, but a really, really large part of the reason why this is a problem is because all of these changes are things that the noisy miner absolutely loves. So I don't know how familiar people are with this guy. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody has already met noisy miners, but um, not everybody knows about the pretty amazing um, behaviour that, that the noisy miner does and the way that it impacts so many other species of bird. Now, a really important thing to say first up is that noisy miners are native. They're a native Australian honey eater and they occur naturally right throughout Eastern Australia, but they are very aggressive. So they will chase away, well, just about anything they'll have a go at chasing, but they successfully chase away anything that's about the same size as them or small, like typical bullies. And they do it in great big colonies. So you can have hundreds of birds who will cooperate to chase things away, especially if it's a predator or uh, something threatening them, like a snake or an owl. But um, actually, it doesn't really matter who you are, they'll chase you out. And so they are, they are very noisy, they're very well named. And these forests I worked in were full of them, up from Barracoola Forest right up through the Carnarvons, and frankly, around my house here. They are screaming constantly and they are well named indeed. They're the main bird call you hear in a lot of these areas. They love these changes to the landscape. They love edges, they love small patches, you know, they love open agricultural um, type uh, country. And they love that because um, their whole MO, like the way they work is to dominate habitat so that nobody else can use the resources. And it's much easier to dominate habitat and chase things away if you can see the entire territory. There's no shrubs hiding anything. They can see you and as soon as they see you, a mob of them will get together, chase you away. Um, now, what do they hate? As I say, all other species, except for some reason, butcher birds. They are in cahoots with butcher birds. They don't tend to fight with butcher birds. Butcher birds and noisy miners seem to work together. That's another story for another day. They also hate each other. So they work together when they're chasing threats away, but when there's no threat, they just scream at each other. And that's part of, that's a very, very poor description of the very detailed social system that Doug Dow uh, worked out by studying these guys in the Lockyer Valley. But they live in these little um, coteries, these subgroups within colonies and coteries, like. 12 or 20 birds will, will together try to fight with neighbouring cateries and maintain territory spaces. Then though, if a big, if a major predator turns up, they will all work together. Anyway, they're a fascinating species. But really important final point on these guys is that they are not the same thing as common miners, also called Indian miners. Indian common miners, they are an introduced species and they are probably um, the bird that you see the most sort of hate directed towards by people, uh, simply because they're introduced. Um, there are perceptions about um, them doing some sorts of ecological damage. It's probably pretty mild. They're not that big a deal. Yeah, they're introduced, but um, there's not a lot we can do about them. So that's probably the most controversial thing I'll say, and I'm happy to come to that after I finish talking. <laughs> but I'm talking here about a honey eater, called a noisy miner, not actually related to the, the, the proper miners, the Indian common miner group. Right, now this is why noisy miners are such a problem. And the fact that we've changed our landscapes to make them suitable for noisy miners is a problem. These are the only graphs, uh, there's a couple more graphs, but there's not many graphs to show you. But all you need to note in this graph, hoping that you can see the graph by now, is um, the, ah, there we go, they've popped up now, is the, the shape of this curve. So basically on, um, on the, the vertical axis there, you've got the first, the richness, and then in the second graph, the abundance of small birds. And then along the bottom, you've got how many noisy miners are in that site. And so you can see that, once you get more than just a few noisy miners, there's a threshold and it drops off a cliff. The diversity of other birds just plummets. So it's a really strong effect. So that's for small birds. For um, large birds, however, uh, if I can get it to bring the graph up, um, the effect is, sorry, the effect is the opposite. So you get more large birds hanging out with noisy miners. So you have this complete shift in the bird community of a site if you've got noisy miners present. 
So maybe a better way of showing this is just with some images of what a typical bird assemblage would look like at a site um, that has no, that on the left that does not have noisy miners and on the right that does have noisy miners. So um, once you get noisy miners, what you tend to lose is all those smaller bodied things. They'll chase a lot of these species. They'll chase the um, lorikeets and, and currawongs and things, but they tend to be pretty tough and they tend to stick around. But a lot of these smaller things, they'll disappear. So there's a big shift in this assemblage. It's a more depauperate assemblage. There are fewer birds, uh, sorry, fewer species, if not fewer birds, and they're all larger bodied. So they're doing different ecological roles. Now, this is bad because it's actually getting worse. So some work that um, a group of us did um, uh, back in 2012, I think, was to actually look at the reporting rate and how much it's changed. Um, that was over the 20 years to, as I say, to about uh, 2012 or so. Um, but you can see that basically all of those grey shaded, uh, uh, all the grey, anything other than the very palest colour, are bioregions where noisy miners had increased in their reporting rates. So the chance of having noisy miners was increasing year on year in those black areas by up to 20% a year. So it's a really fast increase. And you know, this is because they, they love open habitat structure and we are frantically making more open habitat structure. Um, they like drought because drought makes more open habitat structure, right? It, it moves, leaves drop, shrubs die, habitat complexity reduces. But then they can hang on even once the habitat gets dense again if the drought breaks. And they love edges, which we create all the time by um, fragmenting our landscapes. Um, even very dense habitats, so Tui Forest is a perfect example of a, of a site that has quite dense habitat that's mostly not that suitable for noisy miners. But wherever there are edges, and so they've got some open space next to the woodland, um, that's where they really, um, uh, really hang on. And often edges are also where the fertile soils are. These are another species that really like those more fertile agricultural um, soils. Now, the upshot of all of this is that this is recognised as a major problem. So they are listed as a key threatening process in New South Wales, in Victoria, and nationally under the UPBC Act. Queensland doesn't have key threatening process listings. I'm sure that if they did, this would be one of them. So um, our group did some work to nominate them uh, as, nation, as, a, as a nationally significant key threatening process. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's a problem, it's recognised as a problem. What we want to know is what can we do about it? Um, well, as I've said, one of the re main reasons why we've ended up here is because we've cleared so much habitat and fragmented it I guess we could revegetate it all and put it back and put all the shrubs back. And that's a nice idea. And, and certainly in some places we need to be doing that. But a lot of these places are being used. They're being used to graze cattle. They're being used in, in ways that are going to continue. So it, we're sort of limited um, the extent to which we can do that. But where we can, we should be focusing on dense vegetation when we put vegetation back. We really need to try to stop creating new edges where there aren't edges before. So try to reduce the amount of fragmentation. Um, we need to, this is a controversial one, we need to reduce the amount of burning um, in some situations. So in the case of Barracoola, now I don't know what it's like in recent years, it's been some time since I went out there, but I couldn't find a place that had been um, more than 15 years without having a fire through it. So there was just nowhere that was um, actually ever getting to a level of, of dense uh, habitat that made it not suitable for noisy miners. So they dominated the whole area. So um, sometimes creating those dense unburnt areas means burning more in some other areas, but not burning everywhere all the time. Okay, removing grazing. So where we can reduce grazing pressure in woodlands and forests that's likely to help. They really like um, grazed understories. Here's another one that might be slightly controversial, especially in Ipswich, is re do replanting, do revegetation, but don't do it with eucalypts. Now, these guys love 
eucalypts. They need, because they hang out year round, like a lot of our honey eaters, they travel around looking for where flowering gum trees are, but not these ones. They establish a territory and they stay there all the time. So they need food all the time. And so the food isn't so much just nectar because nectar is only occasionally there. They like lerp, the sugary secretions of psyllid insects. And psyllid insects like eucalypts. And so that is why these guys love eucalypts. So um, non-eucalypt plantings is the go. And you only need a few eucalypts in amongst the planting for it to become suitable for noisy miners. Uh, grevilleas is another one, beautiful plants. I've got some myself, but if you plant too many grevilleas in a suburban garden, it's just awesome fuel for noisy miners. And it attracts all those big and aggressive birds um, and, and is not so good for the small ones, which tend to be insectivorous anyway. So what about here where I am? Um, I was gonna give an example of what this looks like. So this is an old photo I found on the weekend of our this part of our yard. So this is an old horse paddock where I'm living right now, um, sort of between, not that far from Glamorgan Vale. So sort of between Marburg and Glamorgan Vale. And it's a very horsey area. So pretty much everywhere looks like this, just open grass. Doesn't look like this at the moment. There's no green anywhere, um, but basically no trees. And so when, as you can see, when we moved in about 10 years ago, we set to planting. And so um, what we planted was no eucalypts at all and only dry rainforest species, rosewood scrub species, the, the, the semi-evergreen vine thicket type stuff. You can see in the foreground here, a great big, um, Brigolo, so lots of lots of brigolos because there's some of those hang, uh, occurring naturally in this area, and lots of other things, flinders, ears, jaggers, that sort of stuff. Um, I think it looks fantastic. It doesn't look very fantastic in these photos because it's pretty dry at the moment, but when uh, when it rains, it looks much better. Um, but the birds love it. So what's happened since we've done this in the last ten years? The noisy miners. I can still hear them. They're in all the neighbours' paddocks all around. They sometimes fly through, but they've given up on defending this patch here. And so instead, what we've got is, I mean, speckled warblers breeding. That's pretty exciting. Speckled warblers are a pretty good sign. You've got some sort of useful scrubby habitat for birds. Um, and 130 other species. When we first moved in here, it was just big species, um, raptors and, and, and things like that. Now we get heaps of little woodland birds. So that's pretty exciting. The final point that I wanted to suggest though, is what else? So all of these, all of these things on our list of what we can do about this, this problem native species um, involves changing habitat pretty substantially. The fact is that huge areas of Australia, we're never going to be able to do any of these things for some reason. Maybe they just are eucalypt woodland, maybe they are needed for other land uses, maybe we do have to burn them, um, maybe we cannot get, um, maybe it's too expensive to get understory back across huge, huge areas and we are unlikely to be able to replant vast areas of agricultural land. So we need to really make the most of understanding what our options are. One of the other options is, well, we could shoot them. There are problem species. Yeah, they're native, but we do shoot native species. Um, one of the things that blew my mind and one of the things that brought me around to thinking, no, we should actually consider whether culling these, these species actually works and can be done, is getting some stats from Victoria. Victoria writes permits to kill hundreds of wombats every year. I don't know what it's like in Queensland, maybe it's the same, I don't know, well, not wombats, but maybe, maybe it's um, similar, but there are an awful lot of species you wouldn't automatically think of as pest native species that, that people kill. So we already kill huge numbers of silver eyes, friar birds, you know, the list goes on and obviously kangaroos and wallabies. So, you know, it's not unheard of to manage a species. What's maybe more unheard of is to manage it for conservation reasons. So um, there are a lot of questions around this, but the biggest one is, well, does it even plausibly work? And the, the thing is, it can, we know it can, because there have been some small scale trials, particularly in Victoria, um, and one or two up here, that have um, removed a colony of noisy miners, or a few coteries of noisy miners, a few small groups of noisy miners, and they stayed gone, and the small birds came back. So this is observational note, though, um, you know, not really a big experiment. And so what we thought we should do, um, uh, is try this experiment. 
And so um, a, an honours student working with me, Galen Davis, uh, Richard Major from the Australian Museum, uh, Paul McDonald from the University of New England, and Kim Motte working um, with us all, did a major experiment to see what happened when we removed noisy miners. So we wanted to see if we could upscale it, and we wanted to see if the effectiveness of direct removal of noisy miners um, depended on the landscape. Um, maybe there were some situations where it would work and some situations where it would, wouldn't. We wanted to know because, you know, killing anything is not a nice thing to do. You want to have a pretty good reason to do it, especially if you're talking about a native species. So we would want pretty clear evidence that this could work and be effective and be cost effective and the circumstances under which that was the case before we would suggest it as a general management intervention. So we wanted to test this. We took 24 sites um, of about 30 to 40 hectares in size. All of these were woodland sites um, and these were in a couple of different parts of New South Wales. And we randomly assigned these sites to either controls where we did nothing or intervention sites where we removed noisy miners. And so the removal was done uh, with uh, about one to two days of, of shooting uh, at the sites by uh, licensed shooters who were um, uh, volunteers, who were uh, members of the, the shooters, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but the shooters, the shooters sort of association in New South Wales. And to give you an idea, um, we did surveys to sort of estimate how many birds there might be in these um, 30 to 40 hectare patches for the shooting, but we were amazed when you actually start taking the birds out. Every, every There are a lot more than you think. There's hundreds and hundreds packed in. So the next slide will just show the density. Here we go, the density of um, the birds that were taken out. So each yellow pin was one bird that was removed in one session. That's across a 32 hectare site. So that's how dense and how dominant this species is. Um, it's pretty amazing. So I'm gonna skip straight to the results. Did it work? So these graphs are basically showing you um, the results for control sites um, where we didn't do anything. And in the yellow, so that's the pink, and in the yellow is the removal sites where we remove noisy miners. And um, you can see um, uh, basically this is the graph of well, what happened to the noisy miners themselves. We took out hundreds and hundreds of birds. But you can see here that so before we did anything, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, above the, the very first point on this graph, beforehand there were quite similar densities of noisy miners in our uh, control sites and our removal sites. That's good, that's what you want for this experiment. But look at this pink line. After we did the shooting, so post is the first survey after the shooting, there were more birds. This is in the site where we removed birds. The number of birds increased. That tells you something about how densely populated the whole landscape is with these birds, if that could occur. So because of that, we did a second cull. And after that, you can see it barely declined. It was basically the same. So removing, hundreds and hundreds of birds from a, a, a site of, you know, 30 to 40 hectares, essentially had no effect on the number of noisy miners in the site. That was not at all what we expected. These were bigger sites with more intensive interventions than we'd done before. We expected it would be more effective. It seemed to be less effective than the smaller removals. Okay, but what happened to the small birds then? We were surveying them too anyway. Well, this is where it gets really weird. You would assume that because we did not successfully remove the noisy miners or, or reduce their density, that you wouldn't have any effect on small birds. But actually we did. So in the control sites, small birds mm, stayed similar and then declined a bit. But at the removal sites, they sort of increased and, and stayed high. That was the, the richness, the number of different small birds. For abundance, it was much more marked. So, you know, a, an enormous increase really um, in the density of small birds, even though the noisy miners were not still there because it wasn't the same individuals, but the, the, the density was still high. So this is really odd. Now, it gets even weirder. We did not want to do any more culls. Um, clearly it didn't work in any of the sites. So we didn't want to do any more. And we assumed that that increase in the small birds would be temporary. 
So, of course, like, we wanted to get as much information as we could. So we kept monitoring it, even though we did not do any more removals. We kept monitoring the birds. So this is looking again at the first graph, the miners per hectare and what happened over time. And watching that pink line, we kept counting how many birds, and this is up to over a year after the cull. And you can see that the, the, sorry, the pink line, noisy miners are generally sort of increasing in the sites where nothing was done. But in the yellow line, where the removal happened, they kept declining and sort of maybe recovered a bit towards the end. But the difference between the control and the treatment sites where the removals were done really opened up. We hadn't done anything else. We hadn't done anything extra to cause this. So that was really weird. And the same thing we saw for the small birds, right? So once we looked at the, um, the, the small bird richness, that difference was also maintained over time. You can see the, the, the removal sites having more small birds than the, um, than the, the control sites. And similarly with the density of small birds as well, right? So remember that that separated out, that stayed pretty separate too. And this is like over, well over a year after the final um, removal. So this is very strange. What we think is probably happening is that all the birds, the influx of noisy miners that came in after all of their cousins were removed, are just floated birds. They're not a whole colony coming in and taking over the territory. They're individual birds that haven't got any social structure yet or not a social structure that resembles the normal, the natural sort of structure of a colony. They don't know how to work together yet. They don't know each other and they don't know who to fight. So they're not effectively excluding the small birds. So it really shows it's not just the presence of the noisy miners, it's their behaviour and their ability to cooperate with one another that seems to be having this effect. So this is weird. I'm going to wrap it up now, but basically, um, what does all this mean that we should be doing if we want to keep our woodland birds um, around? Obviously, keeping some of their habitat around is the first step. We need to stop habitat destruction. But there is potential for the control of noisy miners to rebird really big areas. We just don't quite understand yet why it works sometimes and why it doesn't work other times. And it's important to remember that, you know, we're talking about um, a complex ecology and it's it's too simple to say native is good, introduced is bad. In this case, the native species is really the big problem. And I'm worried that change in landscapes is going to continue to make the noisy miner problem worse. So say we open up more of Northern Australia, introduce edges and agricultural, agriculture to areas that are currently not um, extensive, that could um, create much more suitable noisy miner habitat and habitat for their close relatives, the yellow-throated miners that have pretty similar behaviour and chase out other birds. Climate change, drought and fire both suit noisy miners very well, you know, so this is really worrying. But of course there are opportunities as well, so getting vegetation back into landscapes and valuing it, um, there are programs like the Land Restoration Fund which give opportunities to, to um, incentivise that, to, to pay for biodiverse carbon plantations. But we need to work out of the things that we do, what actually works for woodland birds? Um, what evidence do we have that different sorts of conservation interventions are effective? And so, um, and the, the example of testing the noisy miner intervention is a great example of why we really do need to test these things carefully before we just assume they're going to work. Um, and that's the work um, that many people in my group are doing right now. And I hope in the future I can come back and tell you about a big review of all the different interventions we can do to help woodland birds and which ones really work. And I will leave it there and see if I can catch up with the questions. Thank you very much. And I, I'm sorry, I wasn't really able to see the, the questions while I was talking. I would love to hear more of Martine's thoughts on Indian miners and why their impact on native fauna is not a problem. Right, great. Sorry, I can hear you now. Yeah, so that's often, <laughs> often one of the first things that, that I get asked. Um, Essentially, I mean, it, in a way, it doesn't make sense to compare the two. They're different species, they're not even related, they're doing different things and so on. But often people do compare them, you know, they're similar looking birds, they're similar size, they've got a similar name. Um, so if we are to compare the impact they have, there is enormous amounts of evidence from multiple reviews, from experimental interventions, uh, from, um, you know, statistic, careful statistical analyses that exclude 
confounding factors that noisy miners have very, very large assemblage-wide effects, you know, on, on bird populations. You know, they have big detectable effects, very predictable, and there are probably over 100 papers that have documented this across Eastern Australia so far. There are one or two, there, there's a handful of papers that have looked at the effects of, um, of common miners, Indian miners, and um, some have found no effect. Some have found a possible effect, but only on really things like, uh, you know, cavity nesting birds, which tend to also be doing quite well by and large, you know, things like rainbow lorikeets and so on. Um, and uh, I think uh, things like willy wagtails. So, you know, there are a few suggestions that there might be a bit of an effect, but it's small. There's not much evidence. It's only on a few species. And so individual interactions that people observe, maybe at a nest hollow that, that's um, being competed for, doesn't really tell you much about the population level impact, the real conservation impact. It's the same with noisy miners. If you just go and watch them, you will probably see them mostly chasing. I keep looking out the window because <laughs> I've seen so many noisy miner chases out my window here. And they usually chase what's there, right? And what's there, what's hanging around in noisy miner territories are the things that manage to hang on in noisy miner territories, big things, kookaburras, currawongs, crows, that sort of stuff. So you would look at that and say, well, they're not chasing any small birds. That's because small birds just aren't even there. They're not even occupying the same areas at all. That's how big their impact is. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. Thanks for that, Martine. Um, Paul Sutton has asked, birds are having to respond to both increasing urbanisation and climate change. What population changes are due to such factors? Mm, it's a good question. I mean, I think that a really big one is noisy miners. And um, most of the changes we're seeing are good for noisy miners. And so the fact that noisy miners are increasingly common in suburbs um, and in areas that have uh, you know, be, been affected by, by drought um, means that a lot of other birds are declining, maybe not directly always because of the change, but because they're being pushed out by noisy miners. But it's also true that a lot of birds, a lot of the small declining birds actually need habitat complexity, which drought and associated risks like fire tends to reduce. And um, so the things that we see doing really well with urbanisation are things like um, large parrots, ibis, things that scavenge and things that love the grevilleas and the eucalypts that we tend to keep around in our suburbs. And all the things that do poorly are the small insect eating things, things like white browed scrub wrens. If you've got white browed scrub wrens in your garden, that's a pretty good sign, you know. Um, all the small, small honey eaters that get bullied away, they tend to be losers. So yeah, that'd be um, a very broad summary of a very complex issue. Thanks again, Martine. We have one other question from Denny Hell. She's asked, how does habitat fragmentation impact Ipswich species? So for example, glossy blacks, um, quails, powerful owls, swift parrot, the regent honey eater. Yeah, that's a good question too. Most of those species are affected by habitat loss much more than fragmentation because they're mostly really highly mobile, not so much black-breasted button quails, but the others, um, you know, region honey eaters, path flowers, et cetera, they're very mobile. So habitat fragmentation per se is not that big a deal. It's the fact that there is just less habitat. So every patch of habitat that's lost, whether it's structurally connected to another bit of habitat or not, is gonna be an important loss for those species. And especially things like powerful owls that actually also need pretty you know, big sort of forest areas to, to be hunting in. Um, you don't want to reduce the size of those patches. The breaking apart of the habitat is less of a key thing for those. But then if you think about things like black-breasted button quail, now they are affected by fragmentation um, largely through secondary factors, because once you fragment, if you, you know, if you fragment, I mean, all of our semi-evergreen -ever vine thickets are already fragments, right? But, you know, the edges, they are so prone to weed incursion and the weeds get in and then they're also at risk of fire. And so you get the habitat degradation caused by the, you know, 
exacerbated by the fragmentation and it's much, much harder to manage them. Uh, Martine, that's all the questions that we have. Um, for Ipswich City Council, I'd like to thank you a lot for presenting today and for all of our attendees for linking in. Um, if anyone has missed parts of the presentation or had trouble hearing it at all, a recorded version of this will be up on the Ipswich City Council EnviroForum webpage next week. Um, so you can share it with your networks as well. Um, yeah, I found that really informative and really enjoyed it. So thank you so much, Martine. Thank you. I really enjoyed it too. And thanks for all the questions. They were great. Cheers. We'll end that there. Okay. Bye. Thank you.